So aside from um, the title sounding a little bit salesy, um, it kind of covers what I want to try and sort of get through. I've, I've got an objective, which is to try and change the way everyone thinks about projects just a little bit. But I'll get into that in a second. About me. Um, some of you can't hear me at the back. Okay, some of you, some of you don't know me. Um, I'm John Thornton. I've been with Head Forwards and the sort of parent sister company, whatever UK Network, for 11 years. Uh, in that time, I was sort of developer, uh, lead developer, technical <coughs> director, and now I don't have a job title as such. I've put myself as Pathfinder on LinkedIn, which kind of describes what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to sort of find a way from present state to a successful outcome. Um, which hopefully that's what we're all doing. Uh, before Head Forwards, uh, I ran my own company, software company for 10 years, little company, Wolverhampton. Uh, also had a, a training company at that time for a couple of years, uh, which I pulled out of because I chose a fellow director unwisely. Um, but before that, um, I had sort of five years in a, a college doing software and technical support. Before that, from 16 years old, I've had a really diverse background from window cleaner to IT manager, and it's given me quite a sort of diverse set of experiences, um, more than most people would have. It's kind of so diverse that um, I'm also a drummer. Um, and for those of you having difficulty, if I take my glasses off and you turn my head upside down, uh, I'm that guy. <laughs> Yeah, the, the hair used to come out the top and now it comes out the bottom. Did quite well, that band, actually. We got a couple of albums and went to LA and got on Radio 1 and then, as, as most bands do. Um, but why am I doing all this me, me, me stuff? It's to try and give you a kind of concept of my sort of breadth of experience, which has mean, meant that I've kind of seen things from a lot of different angles, from a lot of junior positions. Um, as well as uh, a lot of more senior positions, sort of managing people. Um, and it, it kind of led me on to uh, starting to see sort of patterns in things. Um, I, while, while I'm thinking about it, I'm still in a band and we released an album last month. It's on Engine House, which is on Spotify and LinkedIn, uh, iTunes. Okay, what's the talk about? Um, it's about the way we approach projects and how we can possibly change the direction we go in so that it's more uh, people focused. If we can start to look at projects um, more in a woods rather than trees kind of perspective and think about things in bigger pictures, I think we can actually have uh, more successful outcomes. It's also about how we define success in terms of the, let's say, the, the outcome um, in terms of software, the outcome in terms of people, the outcome in terms of long-term relationships with clients, etc. It's also about the way we achieve that success and not just looking at it from a technical aspect. A lot of the things I've just mentioned come down to the relationships we build with each other and with product owners and with companies. And all of that's come about, this, the purpose of this talk is from my personal experiences. From being at the bottom and seeing people at the top making what I perceived as really bad decisions. Being on the top end and actually being a little bit arrogant and not getting the input from people that actually had really good experience, like good domain knowledge. The pattern that I started to see in all projects, not just software projects, this could be a building project, this could be an engineering project, was that everything starts off with all the best intentions. This is like Prince Two Days, this is Waterfall and all the rest of it. Everything starts off with the best intentions and everything's going okay and we think we've got decent momentum and the burn down chart, if you're using one, is, is looking good. And then you get to that last third. And in that last third, 
there's a little curve that starts to creep up. The tension that raises its ugly head every time is in that last third. <coughs> it's when the budget starts to burn away or is gone. And it's when that, that deadline, that initial target is, is the, getting really close or it's passed. All of those um, factors always appear towards the end. So we're going along fine, everything's great. It's a little bit like the, the old thing of the last 5% of any project takes 50% of the time. It's the detail when we get to it. One of the outcomes of that, which is more to do with the purpose of this talk, is when we get to the end and that, that kind of situation occurs, we start making sacrifices. By that I mean we either sac sacrifice quality or we sacrifice functionality or we sacrifice the cosmetic aspect, which means we get it out of the door, which is great, yeah, you know what I mean? We, we, we want to get that project out of the door. It's like, mm, we're trying to hit the budget, we're trying to hit the time. Boom, if we kick it into touch. And we've papered over the cracks and it's all done. But we know the cracks are there. As developers, we know what we've done. We're not proud of what we've done. And it's like, on the face, it's great, we get paid, we've still got our jobs, the client's got their thing, they're not exactly happy with it, but they kind of got it. And what we need to do is sort of, you know, find a way of making projects work better so that they are successful. I'll come back to successful in a second, because successful is, is not <laughs> what the initial plan is. The initial plan, the initial specification, going away from Agile, that in initial thing, Ticking all those boxes, excuse me, is not the outcome that we need to achieve. Um, but keeping our blinkers on and our blindfolds on, rather, until we get to the end, and then making sacrifices is not the way we want to work. It's not good for us emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, however you want to look at it. We don't want to put crap out the door, do we? We want to put something decent into sort of the public domain. Oh, we had to come in here somewhere, didn't it? Okay. When I sort of started to look into Agile, it, it was a proper boom, stop the bus moment. It was a paperclip moment. The first time you see a paperclip, a little bit of bent wire, you go, duh, it's obvious. That's how you put paper together temporarily. You don't staple it. You don't put a bulldog clip on it. You don't put it in a binder. It's a paperclip. It works. We know that. And Agile is, is, is kind of very much like that. Once you sort of go with the, the manifesto, you kind of go, Duh. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Prince two waterfall don't work. We know that. And I don't want to do like an agile thing too much because it's like we've all done lots and lots and lots of agile. Um, but I wanted to bring up a, a couple of things. One thing was um, Toby brought this to UK NetWeb, and I'd heard of agile and all the rest of it, and I thought it was another one of those management, salesy, BS, sell a book, buy into the program. You know what I mean? You just kind of sign up here, do the course, get your Scrum Master certificate, all this other stuff. Um, and I pretty much, you know, ignored it. Toby came in really adamant that it was like a, a really good thing to do. So much so, I mean, I guess you've all heard of Agile on the Beach. I hope so. He's only head forwards, for God's sake. Um, I mean, that's like the third largest Agile conference in the world now. Um, when Toby first discussed it with me, I, I was kind of like, in Cornwall. Attendees, like four. Do you know what I mean? It's like, not a chance, but, you know, he, he ran with it and got Mike and a few other people involved, and it became this, this massive thing. Uh, it was really cool, because we went to these, you know, um, luckily, with UK Network, and to be fair, it's carried on here so far. Been to every single Agile on the beach along the way, so I've seen it evolve from the early days. In the early days, what I didn't like about it was the fact that everybody was going, Scrum, do this, do this, and then somebody else would be, you only do this stuff in this book, and then somebody else would be going, oh, it's Kanban. And everybody was focusing on processes and tools. You need those things, processes and tools, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, it's part of it, it's useful. But that's, that's not really what it's about. It's, it's kind of about this, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, over the years, Agile on the Beach talks have evolved massively. The last few talks, you know, the last few Agile on the Beach have got more and more about individuals and people and soft skills. And it's, it's, it's really, really cool. And the, part of the reason that um, I'm doing this talk is because it 
a year and a half ago, about, I had a chat with um, this Russian woman called um, Anna Robikova. She did uh, a talk this year as well and last year, and she's amazing. Really, really, really massively intelligent woman. Um, her father's really high up in Russian sort of psychology and stuff like this. And it's, it's, I had a good chat to her. It sounds quite scary. She's absolutely amazing. So we had a, a long conversation that kind of revolved around my perspective on this that I'm talking about um, and her different versions of it, including <laughs> biology and psychology and neuroscience. Um, and she said, oh, well, you want to like, do a talk about it? And I was like, yeah, OK. And I promised her I'd do a talk. <sighs> and then Jenny needed to, somebody to do a talk. And then really stupidly, I went, 40 minute talk, yeah, I can do that. Um, and when Craig just mentioned lightning talks, it's like, mm, maybe I should have done that. That would have been a lot easier. Um, but that, 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 that's part of the motivation for this. But um, what I'm going to talk about is, I'm really passionate about, it's, it's the, the, the fundamental um, aspect of making projects successful and satisfying. I'll come back, to, remember those two words, I'll come back to those. You know this, you've seen this a million times. The things that I've highlighted in the yellow, if, can you all read that? Yeah? Helping others do it. This word here, helping, that's the one. Oh, I've got a nice point, I should do this, shouldn't I? Yeah. Helping is the big word there. It's a people thing. It's an ownership thing. We're really guilty of not helping. We've got our, our area and, and that's that. And if somebody else screws up, tough we're experts that they're over there so this thing here is fundamental particularly when we're dealing with product owners particularly in a workshop environment individuals and interactions so we've got two things there one is individuals this is about understanding who people are what their value is what they need to make them feel better, make them more effective. Interactions, that's what we do. It's our responsibility to interact in a way that is leading to that successful outcome. Um, and a term I'm probably gonna be like a stick record on, you probably, I'm probably gonna use a few times, is a mutually beneficial outcome. Yeah, that, that's what we're about. We're not trying to just you know, make ourselves look good. We're not just trying to make the product good. We're trying to make the product owner look good. We're trying to make the whole company look good. Customer collaboration over blah, blah, blah. This is, this is the bit. This, this is the collaboration. This is this one team mentality. Everybody involved has to have a single vision, a single goal, and agree to try and get in the direction, you know, that, that makes it work properly. I mean, it's focused on customer here because that's, that, that's the kind of the, a demarcation line. I, I don't like that at all. I, I, I don't like that. But it's the only way they can do that in a concise way. It should be collaboration. <coughs> That's it. Responding to change. This is a kind of tricky one because it involves uh, a lot of other factors that if I go into, then I'm talking about probably like a two hour talk and I don't want to be up here for that long. The, um, have I got anything here? Oh yeah. I, I scribbled a, an extra little thing on the bottom of the card I did for myself. Um, the, the next few slides, they kind of jump around a bit. Okay, so don't look for a continual flow between my points that I'm going to raise. Just kind of let them soak in and I'm going to glue it back together at the end. Okay? Okay. All of the stuff I've talked about and all the stuff I'm going to talk about hangs off scaffolding and this is the scaffolding having all these human skills and the soft skills and being all lovely and hippified and all the rest of it wonderful you can't succeed without this so th the reason you're here in those chairs is because head forwards has chosen you for your technical competence most of you have been through some form of online testing um, there's been probably like a face-to-face -face test face-to-face uh, -face testing situation as well but Technical competence is not the whole bang. You can get into head forwards by being good at, at a single discipline. You can get into head forwards because you know syntax, you know the parameters, you, you, know, you know the detail of, of an aspect. What the company needs, what projects need, is developers. Okay? 
Now that means that we have to be prepared to step out of our nice little C++ zone and start getting into SAS or start getting into JavaScript or start getting into other things. We need to have a look at the, all of the latest platform changes that are going on in the cloud. You know, there's like functions and service stuff that's happening and Docker in Docker and all these other crazy things that we have to try and keep on top of. But being a developer, a coder, somebody can actually look at something, even in a completely different sort of uh, language with different syntax, can visualize the logic, the flow, the looping, however it's branching, all this other stuff. So that's what we kind of need at this technical competence level. What we don't need to do is, is put blinkers on and limit ourselves. And the reason I'm kind of saying that is we have a natural propensity to focus on the things we know. So if somebody comes to us with a problem, a, a software problem, they want this doing, we tend to limit ourselves to go, okay, with this platform that I know, with this code base that I know, with this sort of set of disciplines I know, what can I do to put this thing together to make something for this person? And we do tend to limit ourselves in this. I, I know I'm guilty of this. I don't know if anybody else is. I'm, I'm not going to do a show of hands. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll do some interactive stuff in a little bit. Um, but the, the, the principle is we need to be able to spread our wings and think more openly. Ah, right, which brings me to that, diverse solutions. I lied, there's a kind of continu continuity in that one, which is bizarre. Um, when we go into workshops with product owners, this is something that the special projects division, I'm, I'm really lucky to be in the special projects division. Um, we've got a really, really good flexible um, kind of leading, bleeding edge uh, development team who are here, so I'd better not say anything bad about them. Um, now we've got a really good team, so we, we do a lot of this. Um, I've actually been holding my hand up, instrumental in initially blocking a lot of this. To, to balance that out, the, the, the guys do like to go with the latest thing because it's got a new logo and all the rest. So we, we do need to think about. Um, bigger picture stuff, like the, the, the suitability of the tool set, of the platform or whatever, to the, the project that we're actually working on. So the project's going to have um, a range of requirements. Now, there's a lot of factors to selecting the, the platform and the, the, the tools that you use. There's, 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 there's more than um, just what we're good at. We can sort of ex extend beyond what we're currently good at, because we do adapt and we do learn really fast. That's why we're here. We're really, really, really good at what we do. We can select our options based on a number of factors, but the things that sort of do always come up is the speed of development in terms of how fast can we deliver functionality um, in an iterative way. The second thing is if the project looks like it's something that expands into an organisation that's going to have more diverse functionality in the future, then we need to be able to have, choose something that will scale well. So if you go and choose, let's say, I mean, with the, SPD do smaller projects, this doesn't really apply to the two bigger teams in Head Forwards. But let's say that somebody went, wanted to go for Magento. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to beep that out because I won't have swearing on the videos, but I mean, it's, it's, um, for somebody who's got a tiny little shop, that, that could be a solution. Okay, It's not one that I would ever recommend, but it could be. Later on, that's not going to scale in the way they want if they're going to diversify and all the rest of it. So speed of development, scale. The last thing is the longevity thing. I mentioned before about the guys like finding new platforms with new logos, and they look really cool, and it's the latest thing, and, it, and it's like a Docker in Docker in Docker in Docker inception thing, and it's like, wow, it's really, really cool. And you only have to do three words, and it writes 55 billion lines of code in the background, and then it compresses into something, and that, and that gets in the cloud, and that goes, yeah, it's great. The other factor that we need to bear in mind is longevity. As in, we've done such things in the past with Google Wave. Does anybody remember Google Wave? Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I didn't, it wasn't a proper show of hands thing, sorry, but yeah, that, that just like went, poof, disappeared out of nowhere. I mean, Google's doing stuff with its social stuff now because it got hacked and, you know, so you, you can't rely on everything, but we do need to look at longevity. So when the latest thing comes out, you do need to do a bit of due diligence, look in the background, who's behind it, where's the money, how long are they going to survive? If it's a startup with a shiny thing, have they got funding for the future? So 
those factors, speed, scale, longevity. Okay, these are just kind of business things, okay, in terms of software business. This is one that's not so good. Uh, affordability. This doesn't apply as strongly again to the two main teams in Head Forwards, but it still applies. Uh, did anybody, I'll do a quick show of hands, did anybody see Woody's all the no estimates thing I was on the beach? Well, uh, okay, so there's, a, there's just a few of us. Is guy, but is, is everybody aware of the, the no estimates movement? Okay, it's, uh, it's okay, cool. It's kind of a, uh, an idea where we, kind of, we build a team, we, we build trust, and we just say we're going to do some work, and we just do it. There's no estimate of cost. All the rest of it. Now, this can work really, really, really well if you're a team in a large organisation, which kind of transposes, I don't know this, I'm guessing this, that it kind of transposes for the two main teams uh, in Head Forwards because you're kind of a team within a bit larger organisation. Um, but on our experience in SPD, and I'm guessing that at least some of the time with your teams, estimates are required. Uh, does everybody need to use estimates when, when, when they do projects? Does everybody have to do an estimate, yeah? No? Yeah? Can I have a show of hands just to get an idea of who doesn't? Okay, so, so, so a load of you don't have to do estimates at all? Okay, that, that is really, really cool. Yeah, brilliant. Um, most of the time, um, we have to... Uh, <laughs> sorry? We do it for them. Yeah. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> I don't like that. But anyway, we'll, we'll have that discussion afterwards. Um, We've had a lot of situations where affordability has smacked us in the face, where we've gone into a workshop with a client that seems to have, you know, decent resources, and they've got a great idea for this epic platform or whatever it is. We go away, we have an internal workshop, and we, we do s some stuff, and we, gen we, we generally don't do an estimate. We do a, a wide-range estimate, so it might be like sort of 20K to 70K, which seems like, how wide is that? That's like, it's realistic, though. I mean, if you think about the difference, like, it's like one form could be like, dum, 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 input, 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 drop down, ding, ding, ding. Okay, yeah, you can have that in an hour, you know, with the, with the stuff behind it to support it. Or it could be it's doing predictive and it's doing this and it, all this other stuff and it's doing nice responsive stuff. And all of a sudden, it, it's like 10 hours. So the estimate should be like 10,000 to 100,000. Okay, but what happens is we go to back to the, the client, we go, yeah, we've done all the work and it's great and it's really exciting and it's there and it's, and it's like 20 to 70. And they go, I was thinking two to seven. It's like, whoa, okay, you know, this, this, this is really, really, really not an, an ideal situation. Um, it is, you know, it's part of the real world now, and it's just something to bear in mind. Like I say, this is kind of jumping about a bit. They are just pieces that were put together. One of the sort of tools we can use um, early, like in, in the initial workshops and the rest of it, to try and adapt affordability and to change concepts of value is to start dealing with ROI early on. Now, we're coders, we're developers, but when we're in workshops, and, and when we're in workshops as a team, we should all be there. The people doing the database, the people doing the front end, everybody should be there to giving their sort of perspectives on it. I don't know how much of this is permissible on the time allowed with the clients we've got, but in an ideal world, blue sky world, that, that's what we'd be doing. ROI, we, we kind of, in, in the meetings, we can start sort of looking at the, the probability. Because um, ROI is it, it, the, the simplest form of, of business. Any business that is still going that is successful makes an investment and gets a larger return. Because if they don't do that, they don't last long. Okay, so we need to give them a tool, a platform, something that facilitates a return on their investment. I mean, it also gives us an ROI as well. There's the, it, both in a sort of uh, psychological terms and in terms of sort of the head forwards making a profit. But the, our focus when we're in these workshops is to discuss ROI with our product owners and actually think about what we are doing in ROI terms. Now, this is really, really, really difficult for a lot of us to do. And me as a developer, particularly, I, I, I do hardly any code now, so I'm not really a developer, I'm more of like a big mouth. Um, but at the end of the day, we need 
to be able to think in business terms, in meetings. Probability of a decent return on investment is something that we can do. We haven't got the, you know, the domain expertise of the product owner, but we have a good idea, don't we? You know what I mean? We can see that you know, if it's a platform that's like this other one that was OK and this is OK, we can understand that with the adequate marketing, that this got fair probability. So we can discuss probability. We can discuss me measurability, which is, again, something that's quite tricky. If you're developing a social media platform for somebody, then their return on investment is not a direct. It's not like click, you know, check out, basket, payment, cleared, done, tick the box, the number goes up in the database. It's not that clear. It can be something that's quite abstract, where somebody talks about something, which talks about something, which gets shared on something, and that turns into a transaction. Or it just could be a brand awareness exercise that makes them start thinking about a brand differently and start purchasing indirectly. So we can discuss that as well. Time. Um, in terms of a business needing to know about the ROI and time. If you go think about the previous slide, affordability, yeah? If you've got a small company or startup and they've got, they've got 20 million quid and they want to do some advertising and do some various other things, if you can demonstrate that in a time frame you can deliver a return on investment before their budget is expired, that affordability increases, yeah? Do you understand that? Do you get that? Yeah, yeah. This is something where, th this is a group thing. This is product owner discussion, product owner discussion, product owner discussion. This here is us. We need to decide what technology to use to, for, to, to, to give them to sort of, to, to work with these things, in, and including the dev cycle. If we have a platform that we can develop something really, let's really, like say it's a framework, we're building something off a framework and ticking a few boxes and changing a little bit of CSS and you've got a bit of functionality, yeah? We've got that kind of platform. It could be that this dev cycle is hourly. I know that sounds really extreme, and it probably is, but an hour, half day, a day, okay, maybe up to a week. If you've got something that is like a, a project that's more chunky and they actually deliver, need to deliver a big functional part of it in a chunk, then that dev cycle might be a couple of weeks or whatever. Okay, these are just things that we need to bear in mind at a sort of technical business level as we work through these meetings which kind of goes into the next step, which is where we're sort of transitioning now from we've done the initial really techie stuff and then we've kind of gone into the, the sort of looking at the business side of things. Now we're looking at domain expertise. When we go into a workshop, particularly, you know, early on, we need to have a clear understanding. This is, this is our responsibility this is my opinion only, okay, this, this is not a head forward spin, it's my opinion. I believe it's our responsibility to do a little bit of digging on who we're dealing with. Okay, as in, what's the company, who is the product owner, what are they about? Because the thing is, it, it, somebody turns up and they're selling oranges. And we don't know the difference in a satsuma and a tangerine and a, a mandarin and we wouldn't know what the hell it was and the rest of it. We don't know about the shipping limitations or freshness and we don't know all this other stuff. Um, if we do a bit of background checking we can go, okay, this is the guy who really knows his stuff. If we have a capacity to discuss strengths and weaknesses of individuals in a workshop Somebody's front-end, somebody's database, somebody's back-end, somebody's scrum master or team leader or whatever that label is, and, the, and somebody's the product owner. We can build this one team environment, but we can start making these big Venn diagrams of where the overlaps are, because somebody's got front-end and back-end, there might be a bit of an overlap there, or somebody starts changing stuff over here. If we can get that going, then we're, we're on to the next step. Okay, now we're starting to get into the soft skills, okay? Now I know the pizza's kicking in and it's time, okay? But sort of bear with me. Respect is a really tricky one. Um, it only really works if the respect is mutual, okay? If you've got a, a kind of uh, expert fanboy relationship and the expert doesn't try and boost up their respect, their perception 
of fanboy, fanboy, you know, or girl, okay, is not going to have uh, as much influence in a workshop. If you, let, let's say that you, you've got a really junior developer. What's a junior developer got? Well, they've got, they've got very little skill. You know, they, they, they can't do much of anything, really. It's like, God, I don't know what we've got. Except they've got exuberance, they've got energy, they've got passion. They're the people that are doing the extra four hours of a night. They're learning the latest things. They've got value. And that drive and that passion, well, that's something that's worth having, you know, giving some respect for. So if you've got this kind of mutual respect building up, that's a really healthy place to be, particularly this respect when it comes to product owner. Um, I've been guilty. We, as SPD, have been guilty. Uh, I don't know how widespread it is. Uh, we've all been guilty of thinking like the product owner's a muppet. Um, and that's, that's a really sort of poor mindset to have. You know, we should have a lot of respect for their knowledge. They're the product owner, they're working in a company that's being successful. They're spending thousands of pounds with us because they've selected us as a useful provider. They're there for a reason, so we should, you know, actually have time to listen to their words and give them value. Um, one of the ways to get that respect to work, particularly the mutual respect, is to find some kind of common vocabulary because non-technical people don't know our jargon. We don't know orange grower jargon. So we need to try and sp as fast as possible. You know, sometimes you can do it in an hour, but more than likely it's, it's like three or four hours and you start to see patterns and you go, okay, okay, okay. And it might be through a bunch of emails or Skype sessions, whatever it is, and try and find that common vocabulary and you will find progress in the way the mutual respect builds. Um, one other thing with this, before I move on. Oh God, I'm going really slow, aren't I? I'm going to start banging on a little bit. Um, right. Respect needs to be consistent across the board. In other words, when you're in meetings, when you're emailing individually, the message needs to be consistent. It's that mutual respect thing. You don't want to be playing down um, your comrades in arms. Okay? Don't, you no know, no sort of mind games, no positioning yourself and the rest of it. We are one team. We look after each other and we respect each other. Okay, this is the, this is the big stuff. Um, I'm going to really have to bang through really fast now. Um, this is massively, massively important. Empathy is the thing that builds respect. Empathy is the thing that makes communication work. By definition, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Okay. The important thing here is it says the ability. It does not say the natural ability. Okay. Most of us here are much higher up the spectrum than people in social services or sales. Okay. It's what often makes us really good at what we do, what makes us really strong specialists means we actually don't communicate that well naturally, but we can identify where somebody is. So I'm dealing with a product owner. I can identify, <coughs> so let's all cough together, <coughs> get it out of the way. Right, we can identify where somebody is. We can have a, you know, a look at how they're sitting. We can see if they're stressed, like I am now. Um, we can see if, sort of, if they're kind of out of their depth. Some people get out of their depth and they start playing power games and go, oh, you're just a developer and I know what I'm talking about. And then you get other people that go really quiet and then you need to pull them out of the, their shell and get the information out of them. You can try to emulate how they are, t in your head, this is, I mean, you know, Try not to do it straight, you know, in the real world. Try to emulate how they're talking, the pace they're talking, the words they're using. Try to think about, you know, what kind of situation are they in? Are they, you know, uh, at risk in their job? Are, are they, you know, really tight on time? Are they scared, you know, or are they angry? To try and emulate that and try to apply their state to the way you work with them, yeah? If you can, if you can do those things, okay, you, you kind of... Emulating empathy, the ability, the unnatural ability to understand and share the feelings of one another. Okay, we can do that. It's a bit like going to the gym. You get a dumbbell and you go, oh, God. But you keep going there, ten weeks later, and it's just a natural thing. You, you don't even think, you just walk in. You don't even look at the dumbbell and you go like that. Ah. And then you put it down, you go to the next thing. 
It's the same with this. It's just an exercise. All you're doing is connecting some stuff in your brain. You're creating those pathways that will work. You actually give yourself empathy, and it kind of works as natural empathy. It's not exactly the same, but it's pretty damn close, and it's good enough for what we do. I just want to see if I need to do anything else on this name. We're all good. Questions. It's called Questions and Consequences. So I better do that, hadn't I, really? Um, questions are kind of um, a really useful tool. Um, they avoid conflict. I'm in a situation, product owner goes, I really want to use Platform X to develop this thing because it's really cool. And I know damn well that it's actually Platform Y it is. I can go, mate, he's stupid, and create a situation. Or I can use a carefully crafted question. I wish I'd actually carefully crafted one for this. Um, a carefully crafted question um, to lead them into using, you know, Platform Y. So it, it could be as simple as, oh yeah, we've, we've done something with Platform X before and it's like quite a few customers have, have ended up you know, going really over budget and it, it's kind of limited in, in, in a number of different ways. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't want to lose like sort of like a hundred grand further, you know, further down the line, like in six months or something. Um, so already that they've, that you've, you've suggested something and you can, you can finish it up with, well, Platform Y's got this option and the rest of it and it's like we, we could do something a fair bit sort of cheaper probably and it's more than likely going to be better suited to what you need would that be something that your company would be in interested in is, is that is that a better route for you and all of a sudden you know i mean and andy's having a laugh at me because it's like um, um i'm a nlp master practitioner okay so um but th that's you, you can kind of um use a question to manipulate somebody people do this in sales and nlp has got a bad rap because it is a can be used for, for nefarious you know purposes it works really well and should only be used for a mutually beneficial outcome. Uh, t -t -t -t. That's what I, I put myself a note on here that says slide limited answers. Okay, because I keep forgetting to look at the slide as well because I didn't do myself any nice little notes like most people do. With your questions, that I'll try and speed up a bit. The timing um, of your question is really important. So we don't sort of, they're halfway through, you already know that Platform X is wrong, and you go, oh, well, 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 well what do you think about Platform Y? You know, you, know you, you need to think about how you time it. You need to listen to all of their arguments and adapt your questions to close them to get the answer you want based on the information that they are providing to you. So let them go on and on and on and on and on and on until they're burnt out, and then build your question in your head, deliver it in the right way at the right time and that'll work. Frame the question so there's only one or two or three outcomes, all of them in the, the route that's correct, you believe correct, in using your expertise that they don't have. You know what I mean? This isn't like what's going to make the most money for head forwards. I know, let's go for platform Z. No, that's not what it's about. It's about trying to find a mutually beneficial outcome that's agreeable. Responsibility. This is... Uh, something that you've got to live with okay you're going to do due diligence and make sure that you've got your facts right before you lead them into that that decision great that's really good if not it goes wrong you've got to live with that because it is your responsibility just because you've led them and they believe it's their decision it's not it's your decision you've just made it you've influenced that it's your responsibility consequences whoa second part of the title yeah um, only a couple more. Consequences, uh, as in the outcomes, I'm, I'm not going to go into the positive outcomes because we all like that. It's like, yeah, it went really well, we made loads of money, it's all good. Nobody cares about that, it works. This is negative consequences need to be, if possible, discussed ahead of time, at the start of a project. Have we done this in SPD? A little bit, kind of, a couple of times. It's something we need to do more of. Um, shared blame. Remove blame, family and counselling. I'll put those together because I thought it just looked good, family counselling, yeah. Um, shared blame. Uh, this is something that Craig is going to hate. Um, you might have a contractual obligation so that if a project goes massively long, wrong because you've led the product owner via your questions into something that hasn't turned out well, do you share the blame? And by, by sharing blame, this is the bit that Craig might like, do you share it financially? Whoa, there's a whole extra 10K of work to do because we told them the wrong thing. 
is that 5k here and 5k there? Don't know. Okay, so that, that's one of the options. Remove the blame completely. We have a proper team. We have mutual respect. We have trust. There's no blame. We just fix things. We just fix things and that's it. There's total trust. That's how we work most of the time. The family solution where somebody screws up in the team. The database guy just blitzes the database and you're trying to reconstruct it out of the file system and building bits and trying to rebuild keys and indexes and all the rest of it. Instead of doing finger pointing, we work as a family. You kind of, you all rally around each other and you go, yeah, come on, we can do this and that's it. Blame is apportioned and we work out how, what to do with that, you know, whether it's a financial thing or something else. That is, that's a separate issue. Family, we pull together. That's what we are. I mean, as head forwards, we're one family. That's how we should think. Cancelling. This is a weird one. Uh, it's kind of popped into my head, um, and it's not a bad solution. It's weird, but it might work. Um, where you agree at the start that if there is a uh, an issue, something goes really badly, uh, and it, let's say it's catastrophic, and there's there's the sort of uh, reparation is massive, we pull in a third person, an independent consultant, to decide proportion of blame. Was it the product owner saying? and they sent you in the wrong direction was it you know head forwards or specific individuals and we agree that we will abide by that kind of uh, analysis okay that 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 really could work uh, i haven't seen that in practice at all okay so this is my crazy musings late at night um but we are responsible for those consequences so the questions we use our questions to lead product owners in the direction we want them to go because we've done due diligence we've made sure they're right consequences if it goes badly, we need to have a solution pre-mapped out so that when it goes wrong, we react in a way that it's already planned. We don't sort of go, nah, and then we end up, you know, with solicitors and the shouting and the crying and all the other stuff that happens. Almost there. Here we go. People. Now we're getting really soft and squidgy. Um, people make projects succeed. Code doesn't. Business doesn't. People, the people that, are, that that's what makes it. And, and also, on, on, on the other side of it, projects can make people. If you have the big project and you've done all this due diligence and you've done empathy and you've worked out all the best things and you've made it all work and you get to the end of it, boom, you've got a pattern. You start making this successful cycle work and you start taking sort of ownership of it. Oh, can I move fast? Yes, I can. Ooh, softer and softer. Satisfaction. You're going to love this bit. Satisfaction is not perfection. It's a concept. What? <laughs> yeah. Prince 2, waterfall type things. Tick, 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 tick. Project's complete. Legally, solid. You can go to court, you'll get all the money. Customer isn't happy because their blue isn't your blue and the, your tick box isn't their tick box and the rest of it. Okay. You can still get this sometimes with like agile projects when you rushed, rushed off at the end and the budget's gone, they don't want to pay anymore and all the rest of it. And you can still get to this like kind of dispute situation. My wife came up with a, a really good two word definition. It's about fulfilling expectation. Oh, that's really cool. And then um, I'd got some long-winded spiel about it. I ran through this talk earlier on with Joe. Thank you, Joe. And he managed to get it slightly more concise about what we do about people's expectations. We are responsible for reining in product owners and clients' expectations. Okay? So if they think, ah, oh, I want to spend 10 grand and it's going to be the new Facebook. It's our responsibility to kind of break it to them gently and via clever questioning, we can lead them sort of to the light of what they can afford and what can be done and all the rest of it. So if we can do that during th that process, then we're in a really, really, really good place. Yeah, because the, their expectation at the end, which is when it's most important, when they have to pay the bill, yeah, their expectations have been adapted to a point that we have matched their expectations and away we go they are satisfied, which is what, at the end of the day, what we want. <sighs> Positive state. Right. I said that was going to be an interaction thing. Okay, 
I'd be really grateful if you'd humour me for 10 seconds, because everybody's got the same face. OK, could you stand up, please? <coughs> Sorry, Peter. <laughs> OK, this is it's, it's really simple. Sh shoulders as far forwards as you possibly can. Try and push them together. You're trying to get them to touch at the front and hold for two seconds. Back, as far as you can. Really, really, really far back. Two seconds, yeah? Forwards, two seconds. Back, two seconds. This is the last one. All the way forwards, two seconds, hold. Okay, back and hold. Okay, lift your head up as tall as you possibly can and let your shoulders come back to a normal state. Okay, if you could sit down, please. Okay. Who feels slightly more positive than they were with them when they were sat down before? I know, I know, I just felt better from doing that. Okay, yay! There's there's some success there. I, I expect, I know what most of you are like. I was expecting like, yeah, I'm not going to put my hand up for that stuff here. Yeah, now, now, <laughs> now but that, that's really, I mean, it's a simple, simple, simple trick. The the first reason I did that was to wake you up because everybody had the face that I have after listening to somebody witter on for like half an hour. And even though I might be interested, I mean, I've been to a couple of talks, really interested. I don't... <coughs> like this. It's, and I'm behind the camera trying to concentrate. It's, it's really, really bad. This pizza and warm room, you know, and a, and a monotonous tone. Um, I, I tried to think about how I could like, do it in Octifier, but then I thought, no, it's going to look stupid. <laughs> okay, so... The second reason, which is the most important thing, is it's just a really simple example of how you can change your state by doing something. I mean, this, this one's a physical thing, okay? Doing the empathy exercise, thinking about your people in your team and your product owner, getting sort of the people involved to have respect for each other, including respect for yourself, as in assessing what you're... I'll just tap my microphone, that's going to be loud. Um, assessing yourself, actually give yourself some credit for what you are. I mean, you're here, you're still here, you're not sacked. And this is a really good company, and you're here because you're really good. And you're probably really, really good at some specialism, and you've probably got sort of ripples out of, of, of skills that are really valuable. But if you put this together, the respect, the empathy, you actually craft questions to get the response that you need to, to, to guide things in a successful way. You rein in those expectations. You get it to the end where people are starting to feel satisfied. They're getting value for money. You can actually step away from the, the end of a project. We know projects don't really end. We always end up having bits more work and, it, and all the rest of it. If the relationship is good, we haven't broken it. Okay. If we can do that, then we're into a, a really sort of... Uh, Good position. I don't think I'm left of anything. Okay. Okay. Actually, I will hang on to that for a second. <sighs> Home run. That's what it's all about. It's about us being happy. It's about a customer being happy, a product owner being happy, an end user being happy to use the software, a systems administrator be happy to use that interface. It doesn't get in their way. It enables them to do stuff. We come away high fiving each other and going, whoa, we did that. No papering over cracks, no litigation, none of the rest of it. It's all about that. Um, in NLP, there's a, a thing called um, a, a well-formed outcome. It's a process of going from present state to um, a, a target state. So like, I, I'm, I'm going to go from here and I want my million pound house in St Ives. And it's like, you, you do all this stuff and you go and you, yeah. And people, this, this works, don't get me wrong, it really does work. But one of the um, things at the end is, is how will you know that you know, it, it's worked? And it's like, oh, I've got the house and all the rest of it. One of the factors that's common every single time is I will be happy. You know, I mean, if you can be happy, like, you know, in a mud hut, then great. If you can be happy in a million house, great. But it's about happiness. We are trying to achieve happiness, oh, success without stress. So you've got it in at the end. Um, happy customers tell people about their experience. It's free marketing for us. Happy customers pay those final invoices. No haggling, no reductions, no litigation. It just works. A happy team is more productive. A happy team is more effective. A happy developer doesn't go off sick all the time. They don't leave and try and find another company with better money because they're doing something they're proud of. Yeah, you need a certain amount of money. You can't live on nothing, you know. You need to be a decent salary, Craig. 
<laughs> but it's not the most important thing. The final thing, happy people, head forwards. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I don't think there's anything that actually has like a kind of questions thing, but I'm happy to take questions. It's probably now too late to do it in here, Craig. If you've got any questions, do you, do you want to fire any? Oh, uh, it's, it's not kind of that kind of thing, is there's not much technical stuff. There, I was kind of worried about this because um, a lot of us like things that have an algorithm at the end or a formula or a, a bullet point list of things we can do. Yeah? What's NLP? Neuro linguistic programming. Um, there's a company called evolution development.com. Yeah, there's a chap called Martin. He's, he's the bass player in my band, and he's also the guy that, that trained me on the practitioner and the master practitioner, and he's ridiculously good. And he's, he's also Lissa's dad. He's also <laughs> Lissa's dad. Do you remember Lissa who worked here? Um, and he's also trained other people within our organisation. You know, um, really, really good. So evolution-development.com, if you go and have a look there, it, that's not bad. Um, be wary, though, if you do a search for NLP generally on Google because it's primarily American stuff and it's primarily sort of sales and manipulation stuff. It can be used for the dark side, <laughs> okay? But that's not when it works effectively. I've, I've been to, a, since I got trained, I've been to a lot of different talks and I've seen people doing, doing NLP, okay? It's really obvious. The only time it isn't really obvious is when somebody is actually doing it for the real purpose, which is for a mutually beneficial outcome. That's what it's about, okay? So if you're trying to manipulate somebody, it'll stand out like a sore thumb. You know, you'll be doing mirroring, you'll be doing the other, so no, no, it, it sucks, okay? Do everything for the right reason. And then you go home, you sleep at night, and you're better at your job, okay? Anybody else? Thank you very much. <laughs>